welcome. Uh, tonight's webinar will start at 5 p.m. It's on ending the drug war and beginning the road to recovery, as you can see. We will introduce the panelists as we get started. Uh, this is number six in our webinar series, or seven. 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 In our webinar seven. series, which has already been viewed over 10,000 times. It's been uh, quite a success with issues like Medicare for All and uh, the cost of war, um, racial inequality in the United States. And uh, this will be live streamed on Facebook, where uh, it will surely be seen at least a thousand times and uh, posted on YouTube. YouTube afterwards for anyone who wants access to the link. Um, those links are also um, hyperlinked on our website in the events page at lisaformain.org slash events. It will probably pick up another 10 or 20,000 from my site. And of course, I'll link back to this. Super, thank you. That's incredible. Thank you, Josh. The webinars that have been viewed the most times have been viewed uh, in an additional, you know, thousand or two thousand times because of the panelists sharing them through their networks. So it does really help to get it out to a broader audience and with such a such a uh, important and relevant topic as this, it's important that a large number of people are able to see it. Okay, we're about to go live. Maybe you wanna confirm once it's posted that it is live. Sure. Okay, it should I'm be looking showing now. Up. Yep, looks like we are live. Okay, it's time for Chris and I to go. Good luck, have fun. Thanks. Hi, I'm Lisa Savage, candidate for U.S. Senate. Thanks for joining us tonight for this uh, very important webinar on ending the drug war and beginning the road to recovery. This is uh, number seven in our The Way Forward webinar series dealing with issues of the day. I'm very pleased that we have these subject matter experts with us here. Uh, tonight to help us learn more about this important issue. And also, it's National Recovery Month, so so appropriate that we would be doing it now. Thank you everyone who's made this possible. Um, my campaign team, it, uh, we could not do this without all of you in the background. And thank you so much to our four presenters tonight. We have Dr. Meredith Norris, a physician and activist. We have Dr. Josh Bloom, Executive Vice President of the American Council on Science and Health. We have Zoe Brokos, co-founder of the Maine Harm Reduction Alliance, and Glenn Simpson, therapist and activist, is returning to help us out with this webinar. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, how we will use the 90 minutes for the webinar. Um, we'll be hearing from each of the presenters for about 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, and there will be slides to support their presentation that you'll see on the screen. During the uh, presentation, those who are here as participants in the audience may uh, are welcome to use the chat to um, converse with each other, paste in links that you think are appropriate, and so forth. If you'd like to pose a question, we will take audience Q&A at the end of the webinar, about the last 30 minutes or so, and we ask that you use the Q&A function on your Zoom webinar setting um, to put those questions in. Someone on my team will be looking them over, and you have the opportunity to upvote questions that you would most like to hear ask so we will be selecting the questions that there's the most audience interest in. So thanks everyone for being here. I really appreciate your taking the time to do this. Our first guest tonight is Dr. Meredith Norris. She has been treating substance use disorder in Maine for over 14 years. Her practice has encompassed being a rural family physician, rural emergency medicine, obstetric services, medical director of two methadone clinics, and IOPs in Lewiston, Augusta, and Sanford. She also has a private practice in Kennebunk, as well as working with an opioid health home in Biddeford. She's been an outspoken advocate for harm reduction, evidence-based treatment of substance use disorder, and reducing stigma and derogatory language. She is an associate clinical professor at the UNE College of Osteopathic Medicine, where she's a lecturer and frequent clinical educator of the medical students. She hopes to develop a new generation of healthcare providers, which is led by compassion and evidence. 
She lives with her family and pets in Kennebunk and is happy to report that the kids are already a presence in local advocacy movements. Welcome, Dr. Meredith Norris, and over to you. Thank you. So I believe my slides are coming up. There we go. Um, yeah, so I've been um, working with uh, treating substance use disorder previous to my having gone to med school when I worked in mental health in the DC area. And uh, then later on in my role as a physician, um, you know, in Maine, I've been in Maine since 2003. And I want to really just relate what my experiences have been. I, I named the, the talk this title because it's, it's been like one of those dreams where you're running around yelling, it's an emergency, it's an emergency, and no sound comes out. And so um, that's, that's really um, exhausting and stressful. Um, and I wanna, I, I'm a big believer in telling the story uh, and just describing um, the pitfalls and the evolution of the process as awareness has grown in Maine and uh, reiterate that we're in no way done. Um, can I have the first slide or the next slide? There we go. Uh, this morning I was uh, talking to a med student who was shadowing me and I said, what kind of things do you think are important? And she said, um, well, I mean, how far do you want to go back? Do you want to go back to the Reagan era? And I said, well, no. And then I said, well, yeah, actually, because I, I felt like there's a lot of policy culture and narrative today that was very much informed by, by Reagan era um, drug policy. And the thing that always makes me the most crazy and which has persisted um, to present day is the idea that just saying no is in some way a realistic intervention for a substance use disorder because it implies that you can be at risk for substance use disorder, have the uh, brain changes that happen in the presence of substance use disorder, be around people who are using, and then at the 11th hour when somebody puts it in front of you an incredibly triggering situation that just saying no is going to be uh, significant and impactful enough. And it, it creates a really unrealistic set of expectations, both for, for people with substance use disorder and their loved ones, because it has still lingered the idea that it's a matter of simply declining what's offered the way you might say, no, I don't want a donut after coffee hour. Uh, it reinforces that it was a decision and it contributed to demonizing and othering the people who use drugs. Um, it has been a useful narrative to be co-opted when people are trying to create um, racial and ethnic tension um, because as many people who've lived in Maine for more than four or five years know, um, it's been a big part of the culture of, well, what it is is that these other people, people of color um, or, pe or indigenous people from up north, they come down and they foist these things onto our nice people. And so we need to stop them because they're criminals. And so what is actually a health concern we are in the position of treating as a, um, a forensic concern, which obviously is a clinical mismatch and makes for uh, pretty significant complications in my role as a physician. Um, next slide. Back, okay, back up, there we go. So it was really terrific a few years ago when the police started to try to have programs in which somebody with a substance use disorder would be referred into a treatment environment rather than into jail. And what I really wanna emphasize is that the police, um, that there's some wonderful, wonderful um, police departments in the state of Maine. Uh, I've worked with Bob McKenzie in Kennebunk and Chief Connolly in Sanford. And in many regards, the police were among the first to realize that um, arresting the heck out of people was not actually working and they started being very creative. Um, and if all they did was start saying, I'm not gonna keep arresting and criminalizing these folks, that would have been great. Um, some of the programs though were well-meaning but um, not evidence-based. There was a lot of very high um, resource intensive, you know, sending people to Florida, sending people out of state to abstinence-based programs. And they got a lot of really laudatory response. And it is terrific that 
you know, the law enforcement was trying to get involved. They were definitely among the first to identify that we needed to approach the problem differently. Um, but as I'm sitting here, would you ask the, like, the police are not supposed to know how to manage this problem. The police are supposed to, um, you know, know how to be good citizens and to maybe help people um, connect the resources they, they need. But there's, you know, like any healthcare problem, it's complicated and there's a lot of issues um, involved in substance use disorder. And just like you wouldn't want me to go out and arrest people, the police really are not, we tend to expect the police to solve our problems in a way that's very unfair. Just the same way we expect teachers to now be in charge of every single thing that could happen in a, in a child's life. We tend to think that the police are supposed to fix every social injustice and they're not prepared for that. And that's not really their job. And while people were getting sent out of state um, to abstinence-based programs, um, it was becoming very frustrating for those of us who work in the field. So yes, exactly, this is the next slide. We actually know there, there is evidence for how to make this work. Abstinence-based therapy, and for people who aren't familiar with it, it means that you send someone off to quote rehab and there's no medication involved and no really addressing the neurotransmitters involved. Um, you just kind of are supposed to focus and get better. And um, not only is there no evidence that it's helpful, there's evidence that it's not helpful. And I will reiterate, if we are talking about cancer, we are talking about heart disease, and I, as a physician, offered a treatment that had as bad of a record as abstinence-based therapy does, um, I would be committing malpractice. Um, but, but yet that was sort of the high profile standard that was happening. Um, there's really good um, data as far as harm reduction. Um, one of our panelists, Zoe, may speak more about what harm reduction is and why it matters. Um, Medication-assisted recovery, or MAR, also called MAT, is also cost-effective. So not only is it got the best evidence behind treatment of opioid use disorder, it's got a good um, economic record. So this, this should have been a slam dunk. However, what's been a little bit weird, when I lecture to the medical students, um, I invariably get feedback that um, that I'm, I'm political and I shouldn't be political and there's no place for politics and medicine. And I always say, well, no one's telling the pulmonologist how to treat asthma. But although I have to practice according to the standards of best medical evidence, um, I still have to go up against my DHHS worker says I can't get my kids back until I'm off the sub suboxone or my sponsor doesn't believe in that methadone stuff. And that's really problematic because as, as we're seeing now for other reasons, um, everyone's entitled to an opinion, but not every opinion should be dry, should be treated as data. The plural of anecdote is not data. And that's a very weird um, situation if you're trying to address what is really a public health issue. Next slide, please. So I wanted to doing a rig job. This is maybe about six or seven years ago. Um, this is my medical assistant and me. And this is intentionally a goofy slide because I was getting annoyed enough at the at the lack of appropriate conversation that I just decided one night on Facebook, I said, fine, 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 because I knew that institutionally nobody was going to actually introduce access to medication assisted recovery. It's, it's just cumbersome and highly, um, you know, regulated. We can't just up and do whatever we want. But I thought, well, I'm in a solo practice and I can in fact do whatever I want as long as it's not illegal. So I literally put out on Facebook one night, hey, look, if you have a problem with this and you wanna talk about it, come to my office and we'll figure something out. And so literally I couldn't do it for free for a lot of reasons, but also because I'd be committing insurance fraud um, with the people that have insurance. Um, make it a pretty affordable thing. People would come in, figure out, is your problem really substance use disorder or do you have a pain management issue and you've been cut off or do you need more supervision for your pain management? Um, I had a pretty good network of um, counselors who did self-pay. Uh, we would come up with a treatment plan that was personalized. I knew a number of people who were recovery coaches or who trained recovery coaches, did a list of peer support groups and um, I kind of thought I was doing, you know, the equivalent of having a local bake sale and it wound up people were coming down from Ellsworth or from Bucksport. Um, really, I have a couple people that I still see from Mill and Knockett and um, people, you know, responded in this, in this do-gooder, oh, this is so terrific that you did this. This is so great. And all I could say was, no, it's not. It's 
it's not great that I did this because it's not great that I had to do this. It's ridiculous that I had to do this. We're treating a public health concern and thing one and thing two over there, prancercising before a half marathon are, are kind of having to do this rig job. And it was very distressing because to know that people were coming from down east because they out of pocket people were not affordable. They were hitting them up for like $400 a month or a visit even. Um, not providing resources, not providing counseling, not connecting people with anything that was likely to maintain their sobriety. And they were driving by how many hospitals to get to me. And I mean, I, I can see where I know what I'm doing, but I'm not Mecca. It was, it was just absolutely ridiculous that this was the standard of care for people in the state of Maine. And I erroneously thought, well, okay, we'll share it and other people will do this too. And that's actually not what happened. People congratulated me for what I was doing. And I'm kind of going, that wasn't really the point at all. Next slide, please. So institutionally, there are opioid health homes and I work for one and it was a neat idea. It was, well, let's incentivize people to start having these comprehensive, you know, less than, you know, more than a rig job uh, treatment environments. Um, however, and I thought, hooray, this, you know, good, we'll have help, we'll have resources. The standards of what needs to be involved in doing this is prohibitive for somebody who's in private practice, because I would need to be able to have the resources to hire a counselor, a recovery coach who is a professional that I would be paying, nurse case manager. So yes, it was a nice idea, but it wasn't really, the very people that we'd want to do something like this, which is a small practitioner or somebody up Maine who doesn't have a lot of resources around them, really are not in a position to do it. The people who would be in a position to do it are large institutions and hospitals who should have been doing it all along because they always had the resources to do this, but we're not doing it. And so I was really disappointed when I discovered that these were the restrictions of opioid health home because once again, it's not incentivizing the things that we really want to incentivize. Next slide. And yes, I realize I'm kind of throwing up all over everybody. Um, I'm very impassioned on this subject and I, I feel like there's a, a lot of things we want to cover. Supply side policy, and this has been normative for how we manage people who use drugs and policies about people who use drugs, which is that we persist in this notion that if I just make it really hard for people to get drugs and they'll just stop, um, we'll make it illegal and everyone's always got tougher drug laws, like it's not already illegal, like people aren't already going to jail. Now admittedly, it's way disproportionately um, black indigenous people of color who are going to jail. Um, if I was caught selling drugs, I might have a problem with my medical license, but I would probably not do time at the same volume as if I were um, something other than my ethnicity. Um, there were policies that will just make it so people can't have pain management anymore. If there's no pain management pills, there can be no drug problem. But oddly, there were no restrictions on benzos or stimulants, which worried me also because as anybody on this panel knows, those are very misusable drugs as well. We'll lock up our, our borders. That's always a popular campaign message that if we just don't let anybody in or out, we'll keep all the people in America safe and there will be no drug problem. That's a good way of leveraging other sentiment and once again, othering people who use drugs. It's not the nice people in our state who use drugs. It's the bad people from out of state who look and act different from us. They're the ones who bring drugs in. As we know, that, um, that that's not really something that um, holds water from an evidence point of view. And yeah, remember in the 1920s with prohibition when absolutely everybody stopped drinking alcohol because it was made illegal and it was hard to get it in and out of Canada. What happened was we got more involvement with people like Al Capone who got into the trade because now they could make money off it. And we got more people engaging with more dangerous versions of alcohol. The people, if you want to read a good book, the Poisoner's Handbook is, um, or the Poisoner's Bible, excuse me, uh, is a really good historical account of what happened with toxicology uh, around Prohibition era because the wealthy people could still get alcohol and the people who weren't wealthy would just make increasingly dangerous versions of alcohol. And I think we all know kind of the analogy here. Next slide, please. So one of the policies was around the, uh, an MME is a morphine equivalent and it's kind of a, um, how do we make things, um, how do we make things standardized because the amount of morphine or pills that somebody's on over a hundred morphine equivalents is associated with increased adverse outcomes, including opioid poisoning. So what happened in 2017 was that the state of Maine 
created an edict that it was going to be incredibly restricted and that nobody could be on more than 100 morphine equivalents. This included people who were, um, had been chronically on meds for 40 years. Um, this included calculations that didn't necessarily hold up according to medical evidence, um, but it was seductive. You could see people, anyone who does pain management or is in a position to do pain management, even if they don't want to, knows that chronic pain is a really complicated animal. It's messy, just like working with any biological entity is messy. And um, there's a lot of challenges to it. Um, and the people who didn't want to work with it anyway now had their get out of jail free card. Institutionally, people started forbidding anyone to prescribe more than X amount of meds and people started, um, you know, you would go to the emergency department for pneumonia and the first thing that would happen is people would start yelling on you for how many opiates you were on. And um, so, um, I can see why this was an appealing idea because it took a complicated issue and made it algorithm based and linear, but of course it didn't work that way. And those of us who worked in the field were running action movie figure like toward the, the camera going, no, this is dangerous. This is a really bad idea. Um, next slide, please. So I, the, I have this slide because I actually gave a, a talk called this, when you throw something away, where is a way? And that when people, had an idea of, okay, we're just gonna get everybody off these meds and that'll be the end of it. And um, because I still treat pain in my office, because I treat recovery, um, it was incredibly apparent to me that people weren't asking the right questions, which is that of the people who are exposed to opioids, it's less than five or 6% who go on to demonstrate a substance use disorder. Now of people who have a substance use disorder, it's like 30%, um, who were first exposed in a medical setting. But the idea that I can give you a substance use disorder by giving you meds is just, is not true. And regardless of what you, what, what is the reality, if I've been on meds for 20 years and I believe that I need them to function and I probably do need them to function and I don't have access to biofeedback and I don't have access to cognitive behavioral therapy, if you take my meds away, am I suddenly going to become independent and high functioning or am I just going to not be able to do what I did before? Am I just going to have to be in chronic pain? And similarly, are you even good at getting people off meds? I have had a great many folks that came to me whose doctor abruptly came in and said, the governor wants you off these and just started a really aggressive taper without any kind of skill building or any kind of additional referrals. Um, and given that we're talking about approximately 90% of the people who are on these meds do not have a substance use disorder, um, that's an awful lot of people to be um, held accountable for the, 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 the problem. Say the people who do have a substance use disorder, what do you think happened? Did they suddenly get sober and go, well, thank goodness I can't get those oxys from my neighbor anymore? Or did they simply go to something else? And we know what happened. Literally by the end of January of the year that policy rolled forward, I had people in my office saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm noticing on the street there's no pills anymore. And I would tell them what was going on and they would say, oh, well, that's why there's so much dope now. So as with prohibition, we went from a fairly predictable delivery system of alcohol to a scary one. Now people knew what an Oxy-30 did. They don't know what they're buying in, in a little cellophane bag. Um, and as long as we're yanking access to these meds, is there suddenly huge access to evidence-based recovery programs? Like, are we going to do supply side policy in the absence of actually providing treatment for people who do have a substance use? Like, what have we accomplished here? And does this indeed feed into the earlier idea of, well, these people shouldn't be using in the first place. And when I would talk to physicians about this policy, a great many of them, most of whom did not work in recovery, were almost crowing with, well, that, like, that'll show them. And yeah, well, it's, I think this is terrific. And legislators were even interviewing physicians who would say, that's great. And it's like, well, they were surgeons. They weren't going to have to deal with this anyway. They don't manage chronic pain. So this was a many headed monster, obviously. Next slide, please. And the bigger question is, what were we trying to do? Because how we approach it is going to be really variable. Are we trying to make the life easier of the law enforcement? 
were we trying to make it easier for the people in the emergency department or the wherever to manage without having to deal with untreated opioid use disorder? Um, were we trying to quote, clean up the community? I mean, if we were, then having more access to evidence-based treatment would be a good idea because having needle exchange, having safe injection sites or opioid, um, excuse me, overdose prevention sites actually reduces public health issues, reduces uh, needles in the community. So, so kind of everybody wins. So the fact that we weren't doing these things makes me wonder who are we actually trying to help and were we trying to be helpful at all? Next slide, please. Um, and so my question is, how is it working so far? This is my wall in my office. These are all people that I have known personally. And, and this is, these are pictures from like their obituary. So there, there's no, and they, they haven't, they've just been people I've known. Some of them, I've just known them socially. And since I took this picture in July, there have been three more added to the um, group. That sign at the top right, uh, I wore uh, running the Maine Coast Marathon um, after being evicted from my office because we, this isn't appropriate uh, for our, our building environment. Um, hashtag yes in my backyard. That's something that we all need to be thinking of. Um, in summary, the things that we've already tried, we do know the right things to do. We do know the things that have good outcomes. It's an important question to ask ourselves, how come we're not doing them even though there's so much conversation about this topic? And I really appreciate the opportunity who's spoken today. And um, I hope we'll have any questions afterwards. Thanks. Up a little bit, Meredith. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Meredith. That was very interesting. I'm reminded of your, uh, by saying that the uh, medical science has been politicized in this case that it's also a similar um, thing. I had just finished reading the book and and the band played on, which is about how finished. All right. Sorry, folks, we're having some technical difficulties. Um, Lisa, if you can hear me, you're cutting in and out. Um, we will, uh, while Lisa's figuring that out, I will introduce our next presenter. Meredith, thank you so much for, um, for your section. That was really informative. Um, our next presenter is so I'm doing this on the fly here. Dr. Josh Bloom uh, joined the American Council on Science and Health in 2010 and now serves as the Executive Vice President and Director of Chemical and Pharmaceutical Science. He comes from the world of drug discovery where he did research for more than 20 years. Dr. Bloom is an expert on the so-called opioid crisis and was the first journalist to write about the unintended consequences of a government crackdown on prescription pain medications when illicit Fentanyl flooded the streets in 2013. His 2016 article, Six Charts Designed to Confuse You, is the seminal work on CDC deception and has been adopted by patient advocacy groups to drive state policies. Dr. Bloom has testified at FDA, appeared on numerous radio and television interviews, and has written hundreds of op-eds and articles, published in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, New Scientist, The New York Post, National Review Online, Boston Herald, The Chicago Tribune, and Science 2.0. Welcome, Dr. Josh Bloom. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm a little intimidated by the, um, the previous slide set because it was really nice looking. And <laughs> my, mine looked like something drawn by a three-year-old with a crayon. But um, whatever. It's, uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, so... Basically, um, the war on drugs, which I really call the war on pain patients, because that's essentially what it is, is not a train wreck. It's two trains colliding into the Hindenburg. It's been so awful. And I'm going to show you some 
day that you probably haven't seen before because it's really hard to dig out. But um, I've been doing this for a few years now and I've written dozens of articles on this and I've got thousands of pain patients who follow me on Twitter. So I'm intimately involved in the um, protection of the rights of pain patients and much less so on addiction because I, it's, it's just not something I know that much about. So why don't we get started with this horror show? Uh, let's start with a brief and sorted history of how this mess began. And it's, it's abbreviated to the point where it's almost inaccurate, but let's keep going anyhow. Um, so Andrew Kolodny, who you probably know, and Tom Frieden, who you definitely know, met someplace. I don't know where. You can't tell. Um, it was in New York, probably, where Kolodny was running Phoenix House. Frieden was the head of the New York uh, Department of Health. And they, here's one suggestion of where they met. It could have been on, on Final Jeopardy, where the topic was ways to screw up people's lives. It's just pure speculation. Um, so Tom's head moved. That's bad. Uh, anyhow, uh, just to keep this brief, uh, Kolodny and, and Frieden were connected in New York via Phoenix House and the New York City DOH, who, which funded Phoenix House. So Kolodny became the um, executive director of PROP, which I call Physicians Responsible for Opioid Prohibition. It's not its real name, of course. And PROP was intimately in, involved with the CDC in its absolutely hideous um, guideline for prescri prescribing opioids and chronic pain in 2016, something we've been suffering from ever since. So the guidelines weren't guidelines at all. Uh, they became laws. And there's now legislation restricting opioid prescriptions in 37 states. And Aside from 37 states, it all makes sense. So um, the CDC guideline, and by the way, the CDC had no business getting into this at all. They know nothing about drugs and they have no power to regulate drugs. It's the FDA. So however the CDC got into this is the topic of conspiracy theories half of which are probably true, but I don't want to go into that now. But let's just say the um, 2016 guidelines slash uh, dictums were an unmitigated disaster um, on par with the Edsel and New Coke in 1985, uh, except that they didn't hurt people. So let's go on. Uh, I could talk for hours about myths, so I had to, I had to um, you know, I had to really reel this in just so I didn't go babbling forever. But the first myth, of course, was the guidelines were guidelines. They weren't. They became uh, laws. And it was even worse than that because it became a pissing contest. So one governor, one governor would go, well, we're going to limit uh, post-operative opioid prescriptions to seven days. And another one would come along and say, well, guess what? We're going to limit it to five days. And then some guy has to be more badass than the first two guys, and they're limiting it to, to three days. And, um, and, and there's a whole other aspect of this that I don't have time to get into, but it's the... Uh, the ridiculous attempt to replace uh, opioid prescription drugs with things like Tylenol, which is uh, useless. So uh, the guidelines became laws, the laws became disasters. So let's go and look at some of the nonsense this was based on. Um, so let's go to myths. Uh, the prescription analgesics are the primary driver of overdose deaths. Well, that's a myth. 
and it's a big, bad, stinky myth. Uh, on the upper left, you'll see in 2011, the drugs most responsible for um, drug, uh, for overdose deaths. And you'll see oxycodone is at the top. That's not terribly surprising given the amount of um, Oxycontin that was dispensed starting in 1995. Uh, the red arrows uh, indicate street drugs. So these are Schedule One drugs. They're not legal. And, and I'm putting there, th those are up there for a reason because you'll see a trend. So I'll move to the right to, to 2012 and you'll see a difference in that uh, heroin has now overtaken oxycodone, which is about the same. And um, of the 10 um, worst drugs, four of them are now uh, street drugs. Now let's hop down to the bottom here to 2014 and things really begin to change. And I'll explain that in a moment. And you can see that we're in a completely different game here. Uh, heroin is by far the biggest killer. Cocaine is second and oxycodone is the same at about 5,000. And you'll notice that at five, six, and seven, fentanyl is starting to creep in, which of course will become the, the biggest and worst part of this entire story. And morphine and meth. Now let's go to 2017, and it becomes crystal clear what's going on here. Uh, the, the top four drugs involved in overdose deaths are now uh, street drugs. And of course, fentanyl, which is now all over the news, leads the pack by a lot, followed by heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine, which is making a big uh, comeback. And you can see oxycodone has dropped down to six. The numbers are about the same. And one thing that I found endlessly either sick or amusing, depending on how you want to view life, look at nine and 10. Hydrocodone is Vicodin. Uh, diphenhydramine is Benadryl. They have about the same number. So you want to tell me that we're having a Benadryl crisis? Um, this just really shows to emphasize that um, it's not prescription analgesics that are doing the harm. And I'll be focusing on this for most of the rest of the, my short presentation. So let's go on. So how did heroin get in there? This, this is a story you don't see any place. People don't know this. Um, but you can see for sure that it's real. Uh, this is the law of unintended consequences. Let's look at the picture at the bottom first. Uh, the 1995 version of OxyContin was a time release pill with up to 160 milligrams, which is a whopping dose of oxycodone. And uh, it was easy to grind it up and that essentially defeated the um, abuse resistant uh, for, uh, formulation. So people now had access to huge amounts of pure oxycodone and not surprisingly, people got into trouble. In 2010, Purdue, which is responsible for a lot of this horrible mess, actually did something right and it turned out worse. Uh, they've been working for years on a real abuse resistant um, oxycontin and they found one. And the picture on the right shows what happens when you try to grind up the new oxycontin. It turns into like a gum. It's not usable. It can't be injected or smoked. So people basically just stopped using it. And you can see in the graph on the left, 2010, when um, the new OxyContin was approved and the old one was pulled, 
you can see an immediate and, and severe drop off of its use. And on the right, um, uh, this arrow moved for some reason. It should be starting at about 2010. Look at the slope of that line of heroin deaths beginning in 2010. It's no coincidence that when abuse resistant, resist, resistant Oxycontin hit the market, heroin went skyrocketing to levels that were never seen before. So who do you blame for that? I don't know. Um, uh, Purdue did the right thing and it turned out to be even worse. I don't know, stuff happens sometimes. And this has been documented thoroughly. This is a, a 50 page review. If you wanna uh, torture yourself, you can read that. I have the um, reference at the bottom, but it's, it's indisputable that it was the, re, the reformulation of OxyContin that drove this entire massive surge in overdoses. But it gets worse, so let's go on. Um, so those were myths. Let's look at myths now. And these are, <laughs> these are real screw ups. Um, the first one I like to call, I cut it, sh I cut it twice and it's still too short. Um, so some genius or collection of geniuses decided around 2010 that we're gonna cut prescribing of these pills by a lot. And it was 40% between 2010, 2016 or so. And that's gonna fix this problem. Of course, this was never the problem in the first place. So if you look on the next slide, you can see how well it fixed the problem. Not so well. Uh, look at 2010, where you got 21,000 overdose deaths. And over to 2018, where that's up to 46,000. And these are just opioid overdose deaths. They don't count prescription drugs. They don't count. Um, methamphetamine or cocaine or anything. And this, this, uh, this surge is entirely due to the use of heroin and later fentanyl and entirely not due to um, anything involving pills. In fact, um, this you know, your hair may fall out when, when I say this, but I, I would bet my hundreds of dollars that I have in the bank that if you took buckets of Vicodin and uh, Percocet and just threw them all over the place in big cities, the death rate would go down. Now, this is not a traditional way of looking at this. It's just... Um, let's just call it an educated uh, guess uh, based on, I don't know, a bad attitude, we'll leave it at that. So um, we've got a ton of heroin now that people are using starting in 2010. Well, uh, the chemists in China figured out that well, uh, we got a better drug than than um, than heroin. It's much more potent. It's really easy to make. I could make this stuff in my kitchen if I had the chemicals that were necessary to do it. So the um, fentanyl started to come into the country in 2013, but really started to make its presence felt in um, 2014, and now it's the primary killer by far. And the picture below that just shows how bad this stuff is. Uh, on the left is a vial of representing a lethal dose of heroin. In the middle is a lethal dose of fentanyl. It's about a milligram. 
uh, it's hard to see. And then there's one of the analogs, one of the most potent analogs of fentanyl, which is also easy to make, called carfentanyl. And this is, I don't know, a thousand times more potent than fentanyl. And you can't even see, I can't see anything in that vial at all. So that's a lethal dose of carfentanyl. So it can't be any surprise that once fentanyl, uh, illicit fentanyl and its analogs made made their way into this country, this is when all hell, all hell broke loose. And this is indisputable. So let's finish this train wreck up. Uh, and talk about misery and suffering. So the, the war on drugs is really the war on pay, pain patients. And I know this because they follow me on Twitter. They write me every day, sometimes multiple emails. Um, you'll see some quotes in a moment. Uh, and they are heart wrenching. And I have to answer them all in the same way. I'm really sorry. There's nothing I can do except keep writing because we're really up against a bad system here. And the bad system is docu let, let's go back once, go back please. The bad system is documented by Tom Klein, who is one of the leading advocates for pain patients and just a great guy. And he documents 6 million pain refugees um, as a result of the CDC uh, guidelines. And these are um, people that, these are pain patients, these are not drug abusers. They're people that were existing because they were getting whatever doses of opioids that they needed. And along with the um, CDC guidelines came this lovely little policy called forced tapering, where the CDC all of a sudden goes into the doctor's office and starts telling doctors how much they can write uh, for and that they have to take these poor, innocent suffering people and cut their doses back. And of all the bad things that went on uh, during this, this awful decade, uh, this is the worst. And if you go to the next slide, this doesn't even begin to express the desperate letters I get and emails I get all the time. I'm just going to read the last one because I think it's the most powerful. Um, the day I gave my impact statement to the judge in my disability case, he stopped me, had to take a drink of water, wipe the tears from his face, and told me that I was approved and was horrified that my life as I knew it before had been broken and stolen. Now multiply that by six million and you can see what's going on in this country. So let's finish up. Thanks for the invitation. The American Council on Science and Health is a 42 year old nonprofit de dedicated to debunking bad science and medicine. Uh, we are essentially supported by private donors. Despite what you read on Wikipedia, uh, we get almost no industry money and uh, we depend on donors. We tell the truth because that's what we do. We debunk junk. And I just showed you 10 minutes of the worst junk you'll ever see. So let me stop now and uh, you know, I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you so much, Josh. That was um, troubling and truth often is. Um, it's been difficult for me understanding how medical science has become so politicized in our day um, why don't we let the scientists be scientists and, uh, you know, direct our public policies instead of having public 
policy directors that aren't scientists telling the scientists what to do. It's, it's troubling in, in, on many fronts and certainly in the management of chronic pain, it's, it's tragic. So uh, thank you. Um, yeah, let me just add that um, I, I don't think politicized is really accurate in this case in the okay. sense that everything else is at this moment. Because the, this, this began um, 2005 to 2010. So you know, that was during the Bush administration and it continued during the Obama administration. Um, uh, this, is, um, this is bureaucracy run wild. Uh, this isn't a Republican or Democrat issue. This is just a major screw up by an out of control CDC. So it, it's not quite politicized, it's, it's, it's nuanced. Great, thanks for that clarification. Um, all right, we, if you have questions for Josh, you're gonna put them in the uh, Q&A section and we're going to move on to Zoe Brokos, co-founder of the Maine Harm Reduction Alliance. Zoe's been working in harm reduction since 2009. She's a program coordinator for a Portland-based harm reduction services program which provides syringe access, naloxone distribution, and safe injecting education for people who use drugs. Zoe's a co-founder of the Maine Harm Reduction Alliance and chaired the Education Committee for five years. She's part of the National Opioid Safety and Naloxone Network Activist Group and Secretary for the Maine Association of Recovery Residences Board of Directors. She has provided trainings, presentations, and technical support to a variety of agencies and programs across York and Cumberland counties for the last 10 years. Most recently, Zoe's been working with local community partners to syringe service programming and naloxone distribution across the state. She lives in Portland with her husband, three children, and five pets. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you'll see my cat pop up every uh, so often. Um, so I was listening to everything that's been said so far, and I think um, what's important, and I think as we get really caught up in this um, overwhelming, all the overwhelming data and all the information that we know and all the numbers and all the people who are dying, it always comes down to this, you know, well, what do we do? And um, so if you go to my next slide, please. Um, and I think you have to click again for, there we go. Um, so I think that's sort of what harm reduction does. Um, and harm reduction can be applied to anything, uh, but we often hear about it talked in reference to substance use. And the National Harm Reduction Coalition is an organization that's been doing this work for a really long time. And I really like this quote. Um, and, and I think it speaks to, to really the foundation of, of for those of us who do this work or, um, you know, for me, not only is this work for me, but I also, um, I've been working with and loving people who use drugs for a really long time. And so when we're talking about it in reference to substance use, you know, there's a lot of different things we can look at. Um, next slide, please. So these are common examples, right? And so when we're talking about harm reduction, we're talking about reducing the harm, obviously, um, but it's more than that. And it's really about empowering and providing support and connections. And these are some examples of harm reduction that's happening in our community and across the country and around the world. Um, and it's really a way to approach an issue that we clearly have not been able to get rid of. Um, we've tried, and by we, I mean they, have tried very hard to eliminate drugs, tell us that they're bad, um, make it not our problem or make it our problem. Every, every way that has been approached, I think it all comes back to people are going to use drugs. Um, next slide, please. And people are going to use drugs for a bunch of different reasons. And all of them are very valid and need to be recognized and, um, 
and need to be supported. And if you kind of keep clicking, I think it'll click through the list um, of a couple of different reasons. And, and regardless of what the reason is, people who use drugs also sometimes identify that they need some support in this or some education or a better understanding of what's out there. And drug use looks different for uh, for everyone. And so people who maybe are using drugs for pleasure or um, to be social or to kind of connect with a community, that substance use is going to look a lot different than somebody who is coping with pain, emotional, physical, mental, whatever, um, or because they're in a really difficult living situation or they're dealing with a lot of trauma. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons why people use and we really don't know why until we ask. And I'm not saying just walk up to anyone on the street and ask them if they do drugs and why. Uh, we really have to build it up. And that's where the philosophy of, of harm reduction and, and some of the principles really matter because I think the medical community has showed us really great ways um, to not talk to people about their drug use. I mean, who goes to the doctor and is honest about the drugs they're doing or, um, you know, the amount of cigarettes they're smoking or who tells the dentist how often they really floss, right? Because it's all in kind of the presentation. And so when we're thinking about substance use, it's up to us to do the work and to set the foundation um, so that we can we can receive the information from the person um, so that then we can help if they want our help. Next slide, please. And so this is a slide that I um, think is really interesting and, and it's popped up all over the place, um, but I think that it's important to remember that not all drug use is dependency or, or chaotic and needs to be fixed. I think there's a lot of people who choose not to talk about their substance use with their medical provider or their family members or their counselors um, because they don't want to immediately be, be uh, kind of stigmatized, um, but also told what they should and shouldn't be doing and how to fix it. Um, there's a lot of people in our community and in our world who are able to really safely and um, in a really healthy and comfortable way use substances and continue to do the other things in their life that they identify as being important to them. I think so often we assume that if somebody's life is chaotic, it must be because of the substance use. But I think it's really important to remember, um, you know, and in thinking about the pain management piece, um, or mental health issues that go untreated, people are oftentimes using substances to cope with the stuff that isn't being handled. And so life may be very chaotic, and yes, yeah, substances can take that feeling away and can deal with the trauma of day-to-day -day life and can deal with the trauma that was never dealt with from childhood. Um, but, but sometimes it's not the substances that need to change. And I think an example that has shown this really well is um, a housing first model, something that has been duplicated all over the country um, and really is just the idea of if somebody is experiencing homelessness and you provide them with housing, oftentimes some of these other maybe negative consequences or negative side effects or some of these other things that they're doing to cope with that homelessness start to fade away. Um, so a lot of times people who are using substances and maybe they are using them rather compulsively or maybe they are dependent on them. Um, oftentimes we see that when they are placed into safe and affordable and consistent housing, uh, that that substance use changes and maybe becomes a little bit less chaotic and compulsive. Next slide, please. And there's lots of myths about substance use in relation to health. And everyone can um, read these for themselves, but I think that, again, when we think about the healthcare system or we think about people feeling comfortable um, to seek treatment, um, it's really hard to do that when you already know what that experience is gonna look like. So many people choose not to go to the hospital to treat 
um, an infection or not, you know, or don't talk to their healthcare provider about getting on MAT because they know that the stigma is already there and they already can see the judgment in in their provider's eyes. And that's why I think it's really important for us to do the work um, to set the foundation so people feel safe and comfortable asking for what they want. I've talked to people about how, you know, this concept of patient-centered care that we hear about, again, in healthcare settings, that's really what harm reduction is. It's allowing the individual to decide uh, what they want to work on and, and how they want to approach it. And so harm reduction can be about just providing people with the education and letting them know what supports are out there so that when they want to, they can make an informed decision about what is going to work best for them. Next slide, please. I think this is a telling stat and, and I've seen other ones and this one is fairly old at this point, but I think it really does speak to what we so often hear with folks who are using drugs and just the reluctance to engage with healthcare settings. Again, in thinking of the discrimination that they feel and, um, and just the shame that comes along that has just been ingrained in a community of people who so often are using substances to cope with other stuff or are using substances because they feel good and they enjoy using substances and they don't want their doctor to tell them that they should stop. Next slide, please. We know that language matters and I know Glenn's talking after and I don't know if he's going to talk about this, but he certainly does do a great job talking about this. And I think that it, it's a little thing that can make a huge difference. And so that's why you might hear, you know, I say people who use drugs or, um, or people who use substances or, or substance use, because not all substance use is a disorder. Not all substance use is dependency. Um, just like we know it's not dirty and we know people aren't junkies and we've worked really hard to change some of the language like that, it goes a long way um, for people who so often have just convinced themselves that they are dirty, that they are trash, that they are junkies, uh, because that's how it feels after a while. Um, and I think that when I was listening to Josh talk about the timeline of when we started to see fentanyl in our communities, absolutely. And then we also look at that timeline of just how, how we approached the issue. And can you imagine feeling like you need help, you need support, you're looking for assistance, you're looking for people to help you, and the community just turns away because you did it to yourself or uh, you, should, you should know how to stop using without um, the assistance of medication or, oh, you're just addicted to something else now when thinking about MAT. So the way that we talk about this issue, the way we present it, the way we talk to others, the way we um, just frame the conversation, I think is really important in starting to, starting to build back up a community that's based around compassion and support. And when we model that by the way we talk about this, by, by webinars like this with people who are informed, who, who again, not only do the work, but are, are deeply emotionally connected to this topic, to this issue, it's really, really important because it helps kind of heal, I think, a lot of those wounds that people have felt of just feeling like their community has, has not been there for them at all. Next slide, please. So just more thinking about stigma um, and kind of the way that it works. I think that what we see, and I think there's been examples statewide, I always think about uh, the police officer in the Lewiston Auburn area who died of an overdose and just, just that as an example of the stigma associated with substance use and the way how, um, or the way in which we 
hold people to an expected standard. And I see this within the recovery community too. Um, but when we think about law enforcement or, or healthcare providers or people who are in recovery who have been held to this, to this standard of expectation among their peers, you can't struggle. You can't be a police officer with a, with a substance use dependency. Um, you can't be a doctor who needs help because you are the one who's supposed to be the all knowing and have the answers. And so I think that stigma really does kill um, and really does affect the way that, that people have been able to access the help that they need. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some things that I think everyone can do. And I think that it, it, some are easier than others. And, and not everyone is super comfortable with this topic. And so I think just educating yourself, learning more uh, locally and nationally. I mentioned the, the National Harm Reduction Coalition, but we have some great organizations statewide that are doing really incredible work. But I also think that it's important that we recognize that for a lot of people, um, and, and I'm not even saying like not everyone who, who uses drugs, but people who love people who use drugs, people who have lost people who use drugs, there's a lot of trauma around substance use. And so also be gentle with yourself. Like, yes, we can all do more and we can all do better, but everyone can also do it at their own at their own pace. And so maybe for you, it feels okay right now just to kind of explore and learn more about what's going on in the community. Um, conferences and webinars and all kinds of different ways that you can stay safely in your nest and still learn about what's going on in your community. Um, other people might feel really comfortable kind of learning more about agencies and then asking about about uh, volunteering or donating or reaching out to kind of do some one-on-one -on -one outreach or connection with recovery centers. I mean, there's so many different things that can be done. Um, but I think having that foundation and having that understanding so that when you start conversations or you engage in conversations, you have a little knowledge behind you so that when people come to you with, with the myths that we hear about or um, some of the kind of stigmatizing language, we have something to say and we can respond and we can start to do that work where we start to heal our community a little bit. Because right now things are really tough. And I think uh, for those of us who, who are in this every day, it's really hard. Uh, we've lost a lot of people and that doesn't look like it's gonna be changing anytime soon. And I think thinking about the data that we saw about pain management and the way pain has been handled in our country, there's a whole lot of undoing that needs to happen. And so harm reduction as a concept is one of those ways that we can start to, we can start to do some of that work. It's really a straightforward way to approach, again, something that isn't going to go away. We know that drug use is a part of society as we know it. And the way that we approach it is how we're going to create positive change. Um, Another organization that I think everyone should know more about is the Chicago Recovery Alliance. When I say positive change, I always have to kind of give a shout out to Dan Big, who is um, the executive director of the Chicago Recovery Alliance, and he died a few years ago. But that's, that's really what it's all about. And so as we look at these stats that are very upsetting and, and we know that there's so much work to be done, I think that um, it's important also to look at what what's manageable for us as individuals and then what we can do as communities and and working towards a safer healthier community that's founded in compassion really is i think one of the most important first steps that we can make i think i just flew through my slides really fast also but um thank you it, it was really nice to be a part of this and I appreciate all of the speakers who are here today. Thank you, Zoe, for a fantastic presentation. I was uh, interested that you connected the dots between uh, being unhoused 
and substance use disorder and a housing first orientation. Our last webinar was on the homelessness crisis. Mm -hmm. And there was also a lot of talk about the stigma associated with uh, being unhoused. So that was an, an interesting connection for me that you brought up. Well, we are very lucky to have Glenn Simpson back with us. He's an activist, advocate, ally, and artist. He is also a person in long-term recovery, and he believes in recovering loudly. Glenn holds a master's in clinical social work with a concentration in applied arts and social justice from UNE and as a certified alcohol and drug counselor. He's an addiction and trauma therapist at Counseling and Trauma Therapy Associates in Portland and the creative director, co-founder of RAD, the Radical Recovery Art Directive. Glenn's goal is to broadcast a message of hope, understanding and compassion by using art to reduce the stigma associated with healing from substance use disorder and trauma. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you so much. And, uh, and, and thank you to, to everybody the, on the panel today. And, and I appreciate all the folks uh, tuning in as well. Um, thanks for having me here again. And you know, as I'm listening to, to folks speak today, um, it sort of hit me. I think I think we can all realize that uh, the war on drugs is in reality a war on people. And you know, I could spend the next five or six minutes, you know, spending a lot of time on the history and the cost, and I could talk about the the policies, the policies, the politicians, and the and the police. But you know, what I really want to talk about uh, is the people. And I really feel that my role here today is is to explore the, the effects that this war has on, on folks and families and, and, and specifically on the, the effects on the people that I work with as a, as a therapist. I, I, I wanna tell you about, about these folks. I, I wanna tell you about, about Sally. Um, Sally is someone that I've been working with for the last, um, last year and a half. And, and Sally comes from a family that's immersed in poverty, active in substance use, little health interventions. There's an imprint of generational trauma. Um, Sally's got a couple little ones of her own now, and she's desperately working to break this cycle. And, um, and for the last year, she's been engaged in abstinence-based recovery. That's her path. She's, she's sober. However, you know, her ability to access health care, to access housing, to access transportation, legal resources, and fight the discrimination associated with this disease has, this has kept her locked into this, um, into this generational cycle um, that doesn't, it doesn't support recovery. I mean, her example shows that more important than even stigma and lack of services is it's taking on the deeper problems that created this war on people and, and keeps them from recovery. The issues of, of housing, we've heard it today, the issues of, of having adequate health insurance, employment, unfulfilling work, isolation, disconnection and this this epidemic within this pandemic it's just you know we're even more disconnected and isolated and and i started working with uh with a young man jack about six months ago when when this was all sort of beginning uh, jack was court ordered into treatment following a, an arrest for littering in the Bayside area of Portland. And, and this arrest put him, and this latest charge put him in, in violation of his probation for a, uh, for a drug possession charge. So he has this choice, um, finish a lengthy jail term or seek therapy for his substance use disorder. Great. Now, now we have you know, treatment as punishment. Um, you know, Jack's original sentence was 90 days. He's been on probation for nearly four years. And it's, and it's because of the mandates and, and the requirements of this war on people. It's difficult for folks to get out from under the costs of that, the mounting fines from this 
original charge, the inability to pay. So what happens? I mean, you've probably guessed it. The war on people puts out a warrant and Jack is arrested in front of his family and his neighbors. So if you, if you wanted to design a system that's bound to fail while also creating collateral damage, it's this war on people. And, and whether it's recreational drug use or it's substance use disorder, shaming people is not an effective way of, of changing behavior. I mean, the system that we have in place from Caribou to Carmel kills people. You know, this war on people is killing 250 Jack and Sally's every single day. And that brings me to someone else that I worked with, Jesse. Jesse wasn't a client of mine. Uh, Jesse Harvey was a friend and a colleague and a teacher. And Jesse died last week in part because of this war on people. Jesse was a great uh, resistance fighter in this war on people. He was a he was a force in many ways, and um, and he was a real force for change. He's he was one of the first people to talk openly about creating an overdose prevention site. He educated the public on harm reduction. He did recovery coach training, did hundreds of naloxone trainings. He opened recovery residence for folks. He'd put them on scholarship. If you, had, if you didn't have money, you could get in and have a safe place to put your head at night. He distributed safe supplies despite the threats from the agents of this war on people. And when they shut him down, he created something called the, the Church of Safe Injection. And, uh, and he took to the streets distributing harm reduction supplies in, in, in many cities and, and organized others to do the same across the country. I mean, Jesse saved countless lives. Jesse, Jesse loved to make um, beautiful trouble and encourage others to think outside the box for, for radical solutions. And, and I like to think that Jesse's work was only the, the beginning that all of us here talking about this today, that, that, that you folks that are watching, that we have an interesting opportunity to continue to fight, to end this war on people and, and advocate for change. You know, I wanna, I wanna wrap up with, with, that's, with something that Jesse used to say. Um, Jesse said, no one who uses drugs deserves to die. And Jesse didn't deserve to die. You know, the, the, the time for radical change is, is right now. It's right now. I, I uh, appreciate you allowing me to be on today. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you for bringing Jesse Harvey into our midst. I know many people that are on the webinar tonight were deeply affected by uh, losing Jesse, so thank you for doing that. Um, we have time for some Q&A from our audience, and I want to thank our presenters so much for sharing their thoughts. Um, I will read the question, and I will suggest uh, one of you that might start with uh, responding to it, and then any, any of the other presenters that would like to weigh in, of course, we can we can do that. Um, this question is from uh, Richard Kane, and his question is, how much does opioid and other drug uh, addiction, I think we've learned that to call that use, uh, substance use, possibly disorder, contribute to homelessness and poverty, and what can be done about it? Glenn, do you want to start on that one? I appreciate the question. I, I might even flip it around. Is how much does the other side contribute to substance use disorder? You know, I was telling you about, uh, about, about Sally. Um, you know, Sally wasn't sitting at, you know, career day in sixth grade 
and was offered the opportunity of, of these different careers in their life. And they said, you know, how would you like to end up in a, in a cycle of generational trauma and begin using a substance in order to cope? And in the meantime, blow up your whole life. I don't think her hand, uh, her hand went in the air to volunteer um, for that. Thank you. Any other presenter would like to weigh in on this? I would agree with um, what Glenn's saying. I mean, I think that so often what we see is people who, um, people who are using substances to get through the day, um, and and that can that can have started from a bunch of different places. But you you know, I think that. Um, I, I agree that I think we need to look at flipping that because I think that if everybody had a safe place to live, I mean, it's more than, you know, it's more than just providing safe places for people to use drugs like that. That is a thing that should already exist, but, but people don't have safe places to use because they don't have safe places to live. And, and so the places that they're staying and the places where maybe, maybe they're living are, um, not not conducive to anyone's health and well-being and so sometimes there's substance use that comes along with that um, and so i think we have to provide the the basic foundations for human life before we can expect anyone to stop coping with um, the horror that they're dealing with every day to just get through the day i would say i have um when I've worked at a detox center in Portland, um, it would not be unusual. There were a few people that anytime they were admitted to detox, uh, I was supposed to see them within like 24 hours of their showing up. And there were people that I saw like every third day I was admitting them. Um, they would, a lot of them were, were using alcohol and a couple of them would come to detox because they could no longer keep alcohol down and so they were getting sick and they were worried about seizure which i actually thought was laudable that they realized they were in a dangerous situation that needed to be addressed and i would always ask them so what would it look like for you you know to to want to do something different you know and 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 the group where i was was amazing and that they were radically accepting. I never ever heard any of the staff say, what's the matter with you? Why are you still coming in here? Aren't you sick of this? And give this kind of 1992 era tough love thing. Um, and universally they would say, if I had somewhere to live, like for any of us who have the privilege of somewhere to live, it's easy to say, well, I would never. And it's just like, you absolutely have no idea if you're not you know, experiencing homelessness, experiencing survival sex, experiencing, you know, nightly threat of, of abuse. Um, I, I, would, I would use all kinds of things to get me through those nights. Even when it's really cold and people are using alcohol because it helps them feel warmer even though it puts them at jeopardy. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, Josh, did you have a comment on this one, or should we move on to a new question? Nothing in particular. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, th this is actually a question for me, but I will uh, be brief in answering it. I would like. This is from Michael McCarthy. I would like to hear Lisa complete her comments on and the band played on. I don't know when my system froze exactly. Um, I was commenting that right before the pandemic hit, the COVID nineteen pandemic. I had just finished a book about how. Um, political forces, not necessarily Democrats or Republicans, but, you know, powerful uh, forces in society had um, marginalized the doctors and researchers and that were looking at uh, AIDS and figuring it out and realizing, wow, we're going to have to take some pretty stringent uh, public health actions here if this, if we don't want this to become an epidemic. Uh, but the forces that didn't want to hear that and didn't want to deal with it were stronger, uh, had more political power than the ones that were concerned, the scientists and the doctors. So it was very interesting to me to also hear um, uh, Meredith and Josh talking about um, how 
what scientists know, what medical researchers know, what doctors who specialize in substance use disorder know is often pushed aside and um, people are making decisions that have the power to make and enforce those decisions, but they're not really uh, well informed about um, what the consequences could be and they're not really listen, uh, willing to listen to those that do. So that was the, the nature of my remark there. Okay. Here's one from Nikolanada Nanda. Aloha, mahalo for this excellent and informative webinar. Which community, state, and or other country jurisdiction, in your opinion, is providing the best, most comprehensive programs? That's an interesting question. I'm guessing it isn't going to be the US. Um, Josh, do you have a sense internationally of who's doing a good job that you think is admirable? It depends on uh, what you mean by admirable. If you're talking about harm reduction, it's the Netherlands. Um, if you're talking about meeting the needs of pain patients, it's almost nowhere because this is spread to Europe too. Um, I don't know if, if I had to, if I had to just take a bad guess, I'd say Canada. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on this one? <laughs> Where are there programs in place that you think are admirable and are doing a fairly good job? Don't everyone talk at once. I will take that as you tend to agree with Josh that no one's doing a very good job of pain management um, harm reduction, would you agree that the Netherlands is a model for what the U.S. might aspire to? The U.S. will never go there. I mean, they're not going to give people heroin in a safe place to shoot, shoot it up. I mean, it's never going to happen. It's funny. I, I, I remember two things. Um, I remember being at the die-in with Jesse a couple of years ago and him saying there is literally no reason not to do this except stigma. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely, there is not a single good reason not to practice really comprehensive harm reduction. I also remember being at a, a dinner with Zoe about a year ago and somebody asking her, why do people oppose this so strongly? And her saying very astutely, I think it, people are just upset by the idea of being kind to people who use drugs. Like it, it, it's literally, you kind of go like everyone I know in the office and I treat a lot of different things. I don't just treat substance use disorder. Like everyone has contributed to their situation one way or the other. They're not all eating grilled chicken and being smoke free. Like there it's, everyone has, but, but for some reason, this is like, the last area where it's okay to just be mean to people like the the final punching bag like the, it, so much of our healthcare policy is informed by a lack of kindness and the because because literally what would we be losing by having heroin accessible we wouldn't it would probably save lives it would probably be cost effective we're not doing it because why should they get to mm -hmm. right you know? it, it, and that's exactly i was I was going to say my same thing I said last year, apparently, but <laughs> no, it's really true. It's like it, there's no other explanation for it because when you look at uh, community concerns related to negative uh, consequences of drug use, right? You know, um, hospital costs and, and needles all over the place and drug users overdosing on the streets. It's like, well, there's actually a solution. Um, it exists and it would make all of those problems go away but what gets in the way it's like well well we can't like well we can't just do that like that would just be you know i mean it really what does tell the neighbors yeah right right yeah. god it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense it's like i feel like we're getting to that point now where every time it comes up about the number of people who have died in our communities it's like well there's actually answers yeah. yeah, we do. It's, it's really weird as a physician because it's kind of like 
standing there watching people have a heart attack when we have a defibrillator and we have CPR, but they shouldn't have eaten so much bacon. Right. You know, mm. and I, it's funny, I, I, I'm, J Jesse is going to be with us forever. Um, he had me write a letter to the PPH as to, um, you know, o over his prevention sites. And I wrote a thing saying, hey, like this is totally evidence-based and what's the big deal and let's get it together. And I listed lack of needles around the community more like does anybody want a dead person on their alleyway like there's no one wants like are you really going to stand up and say no i support death for people um i was a little more temperate in my wording but not by much and what was interesting was that the comments immediately said well i bet she's not ready to have them in kennebunk i'm like i am and i do you know, well, get ready for all the dirty needles in your neighborhood. Okay, I just said that. That's not what's going to happen. Right. <laughs> it's like, all right, you, you, uh, you imagine on, this is the designated people. Imagine if you're running for office. Oh yeah. And and your uh, part of your platform is heroin for all. Cool. Yeah. Come cool. on. That sounds what's good. Going to happen. Have your vote, Half your probably, it's probably a politician in Portugal that's run on that platform. Right. If you want to talk about someone over in the chats, in the that States, about, uh, maybe half your, half your family will vote for you if, if you go on the air and say that. I mean, it's so far out. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, it Donna says did. a lot that bla blatant misogyny and sexual harassment is more digestible for the voter mm -hmm. than harm reduction. It does say a lot. Um, one of the harms or one of the um, costs that hasn't been brought up, but that's very real to me as uh, just having retired from 25 years of teaching school in Central Maine is the cost to families, the cost to children. Um, it's huge. And, and the trauma that they experience when their uh, caregivers are incarcerated or, uh, you know, have it, get an overdose or, or a variety of bad consequences that really, really affect their ability to, uh, you know, concentrate on learning anything because their emotional needs have not been met in that situation. So it's another huge cost that society bears and seems to feel as an okay cost. I don't think it's okay. Um, this has been a great discussion, but we're kind of uh, out of time here. I'm sorry that we did not get to everyone's questions. Um, a couple of the questions were be about what would I do uh, if, when I'm a senator and Medicare for all is the first thing that uh, comes to mind. I, I, we need a, a strong single payer universal healthcare program that treats substance use disorders like the health problem that uh, they are rather than uh, criminalizing them. And uh, we heard some very eloquent testimony about that today. Um, our uh, campaign does not take donations from corporate lobbyists or big pharmaceutical uh, lobbyists. We don't take donations from the PACs that launder corporate money so candidates can claim that they don't take corporate money while continuing to take it. Um, but we do uh, accept donations and support from people just like you. We have over a thousand people that have contributed to this campaign because they believe that um, electing the only person who's not a millionaire, a multimillionaire in the Senate race here in Maine could make a difference and they support programs like Medicare for All that would um, really make a better life for all of us. So I hope that you'll consider um, if you're in a position to making a donation or perhaps volunteering on the campaign. We have hundreds of people helping us and um, we couldn't do presentations like this one that we did tonight. And I can't thank you enough, Josh, Meredith, Glenn and Zoe. It was very educational for me as someone who's running for federal office and I suspect very educational for our audience as well. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much to Kelly Merrill who organized this and made all the moving parts work. Thank you to Dave Schwab who uh, makes the live stream happen on Facebook. As soon as the live stream stops on Facebook, there's a recording there that can be shared and will stay there. Uh, because many people don't use Facebook, we will also upload a recording of the webinar to our Lisa Fermain YouTube channel um, for sharing also after that. And um, thank you also to our campaign manager, Chris Kerr, who's in recovery himself. It's a very, very courageous uh, person who told us in the first job interview that he was in recovery and that he would need to uh, practice some self-care in order to do such a high stress job as being a campaign manager on a US Senate campaign. I can't tell you how much respect for him I had that he had the courage and the honesty to share that with us. 
and I feel really lucky to have him on our team. So thanks everyone for being here. Uh, be well, and uh, remember, you're not alone. Thank you.